part of Sebastian's lecture. Very good. So I, I first want to make a really compliment. Yes, it's really a pleasure how active you are. And I, <laughs> I'm really surprised, <laughs> I mean, because you're getting these four lectures per day and still are really attentive. So it would be nice if you keep this, this pace uh, for now. Um, right, so uh, I, I want to just wrap up this section here. Uh, now it's more the hopefully uh, joyful part, it's not as, uh, I mean, technically demanding, we're just, uh, so to say, uh, getting the, the consequences of all our formal developments now. And just to remind you, the starting point is uh, this situation. Um, we uh, just discussed yeah, so that equilibrium systems um, are protected by some specific uh, discrete symmetry, yeah, which is absent or manifest explicitly broken in an out of equilibrium system. And the question that I want to follow now is, let's assume we have such a situation. Let's assume we have this spread of couplings in the complex plane. Yeah? So in the dissipative versus reversible dynamics, they are not um, tied to each other. But the system is confused and doesn't know what to thermalize to. So uh, what's the consequence of that in a, a specific model? Yeah? And this model will be actually this exciton polariton systems that I also introduced in the, in the last lecture. So, uh, and um, to set the stage, um, I want to remind you of uh, what is well known about phase transitions in equilibrium two-dimensional systems with a continuous symmetry. That's an important ingredient now. So we want a continuous symmetry. For example, simple most example is a U1 symmetry. And um, uh, we discussed a lot about uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now I remind you this is an effect that only is operative really in sufficiently high spatial dimension, while two dimensions is exactly the case where we cannot have uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking due to this Mermin-Wagner theorem. Presence of gapless modes forbids uh, uh, um, conden stable condensation phenomenon, and uh, these gapless modes will actually lead to the destruction of such a condensate. Rather, what you see at low temperature, what replaces this really long-ranged ordered phase is what is known as an algebraically or quasi long-range ordered phase, which is characterized by an algebraic decay of the correlation function, of the two-point correlation function. Think of it like that. So if we had a really a condensate, yeah, so then if you have an expectation value at point x and one at point zero, yeah, so this correlation would just saturate independent of x if we have a condensate. Now, the compromise that the two-dimensional systems do is they show still some strong correlation, yeah, and, but uh, it's not, so to say, flat. It's not saturating as in the presence of a condensate. And then it is also well known yeah, so that in the, there is two distinct phases. Yeah? The low temperature phase at high temperature is replaced by a phase with a much more generic exponential decay of correlation functions. That's a typical situation you usually have. Yeah? So if you don't have much correlation in the system yeah, in high temperatures, yeah, the temperature leads to fluctuations that averages out the correlations that typically an exponential behavior. Now also, the, the responses are behaving qualitatively different in these two-dimensional systems with a U1 symmetry, say a bosonic uh, Bose-Einstein scenario or so. Um, you have a superfluid response. Yeah? So if you stir the system, you will see it re responds with a finite um, parameter here, which is lost. Yeah? So the superfluid response is lost in the high temperature phase. And what interpolates between these two limiting cases, between these two qualitatively distinct um, phases of matter is the famous costalitz taulis transition, yeah, where um, the picture is that at a low temperature, the vortices, um, vortex degrees of freedom defects in the phase of this U1 um, symmetry here, defects in the phase are bound into pairs and do not 
show up in the long wavelength behavior. And this decay is, this algebraic decay is then just coming from smooth phase fluctuations in the problem. While at, uh, at high temperature, these vortices, they proliferate, they unbind, and then uh, this, um, this ordering or this quasi long range order is actually gone. And now we want to ask the question, yeah, um, what the fate of such a scenario is in a driven open condensate, so a situation with the U1 symmetry, but put place out of equilibrium. And the compromise that I want to do here, I, I focus mainly on the properties down here, and the rest, I mean, I, I, I won't get to it. So let's think about again, so where do these uh, long range correlations uh, come from? At, uh, so, so just to, to give you a bit, uh, or maybe refresh, your mind or to explain where, where this algebraic decay here comes from. Statement will be it re roots really in the presence of gapless modes in this problem, gapless spin wave fluctuations which do not cost energy to excite them. And the action um, so for, for the spin wave is just described by the gradient of the phase variable squared. So this is the kinetic energy that is contained in the, in the phase variable. And if I go to Fourier space, well, then, then you can see this Q square here. Then to find the qualitative behavior of this function here, we do what is known as a phase amplitude decomposition. So we write the field in terms of a density-like variable, square root of that, and the phase variable. And the statement is, yeah, so that the real, the, the soft modes in this problem is the phase that can fluctuate a lot, while the density on the fluctuates mildly, so we can approximate this density variable just by its mean, by a mean density. And then evaluating this correlation function here in this representation of the field comes down to just studying this correlation function of phases in the exponent here. And um, if we make the assumption, just to get an orientation that this is almost a Gaussian problem, then you can use a few nice identities for evaluating such correlators here, and you find that the expectation of the expe expectation of e to the i is um, the square of the argument here in the exponent. That's a Gaussian integration identity, and then you see we want to know this correlation function here. Here is how you calculate that. We Fourier transform um, the spin wave uh, Green's function, yeah, so which shows in particular this Q square dependence down here. And you see that this function here has this, this function as Q goes to zero, there's an infrared divergence which shows up as a logarithmic dependence yeah, on, this, uh, on the distance between the two points. Yeah? R is the absolute value of, of the distance. Yeah? And inserting now this logarithmic correlator here, then um, you see E to the log of something and just gives us this algebraic function. So that's the reminder on equilibrium. And now we want to understand how do the non-equilibrium conditions affect this uh, low temperature, I mean, where there is no temperature out of equilibrium, not obviously, uh, how does the, the non-equilibriumness of this problem affect this, this result here? Okay, and to this end, I mean, in our way of, of thinking, yeah, we can start, we do, not, we do not need to start on the totally microscopic scale in the problem. We can actually already move to this uh, semi-classical limit for this problem because we are interested really in very, very long wavelengths or very low frequency quantities, which are by definition well below the noise level in our problem. That's when we can take the semi-classical limit and then we are entitled to describe the whole problem, this pro whole quantum problem, in terms of this simplified uh, Langevin equation here. Yeah? So at this level, we still want to do some simplification, and we, uh, because it's still a complicated equation with two fluctuating variables, but we are guided now by the intuition that I was just telling you, that this field can be well represented in terms of a density variable and a phase variable. Yeah? And if one does, the calculation, one sees actually that the time evolution for the density variable is very fast. It damps out very quickly. So this is a fast variable that we can integrate out or adiabatically eliminate. And what we end up with is an evolution equation just for the phase variable alone. Yeah? 
So this is a kind of um, RG step, if you like, yeah, where we integrate out fast fluctuations in the problem. Yeah? So these are these density fluctuations, but we keep everything that is still active on the largest distances in the problem. And that's always the terms that come with a lot of gradients, yeah? because as momentum goes to zero, yeah? so this gradient, powers of gradient becomes power of momentum, and that uh, is still, I mean, active in the, in the long wavelength limit. Yeah? And it's not, not leading to a quick damp out of these fluctuations. Okay, and then, I mean, so doing this step, yeah, we arrive um, just by, by just doing it, we arrive at this equation here, and this is actually a pretty famous equation. It is referred to as a Cardin, or it goes back to Cardin, Parisi, and Zhang, yeah, we, who studied a completely different problem, which I will uh, also tell you, namely the, the roughening of surfaces. So in our, or of interfaces, in our case, this interface is realized by the phase uh, of this U1, uh, U1 symmetry that we were starting from in this exciton polariton condensates. So, and uh, just to go through these terms, so the time evolution of the phase is generated by phase diffusion. Yeah? So there's a, line, there's, a, there's a Z equals two dynamic exponent between time and space. But then there's also this important uh, nonlinear term and there's, of course, noise that is in here inherited from the noise that we had in this problem originally. Okay, and um, the main way how to read this equation now is the interesting um, uh, uh, insight yeah, so that this spin wave mode, yeah, so this is called the spin wave, yeah, so what usually behaves diffusively in such systems with, without a nonlinear term now becomes nonlinear. So our... Goldstone mode in the problem, this U1 phase mode, becomes nonlinear by this KPZ term. And what is more, one can convince oneself that at least in dimensions D equals 2 and larger, this nonlinearity is strictly forbidden if the system is at equilibrium. So going back to this picture here that, that we had, if we are in such a situation at equilibrium, then it is in dimension larger equal two ruled out that such a nonlinear coupling occurs while, I mean, in an out of equilibrium problem, there's absolutely nothing against it. Yeah? And you can think of RG or coarse graining as, as the statement that everything that can happen, everything that is allowed by symmetry, that will also happen, yeah? that will be generated under RG transformations, under coarse graining. Yeah? Everything that's uh, compatible with symmetry. And this is a term that is compatible with U1 phase rotation symmetry, but not compatible with equilibrium symmetry. So out of equilibrium, it will be present. Okay, so maybe a bit of background for this KPZ equation, where it really comes from. It is actually a problem that is connected to the roughening of, of surfaces. And the simple most um, physical situation that was also advocated in, in this paper here, in the, in, in, uh, so, yeah, in the original one, um, is actually uh, the growth of interfaces. So here you have a situation where I have a, um, a plane, a tilted plane. The tilt is crucial because when combined at the tilt of the plane with a gravitational field, you can see that there's a downhill acceleration. Yeah? So while these particles are falling from the top yeah, and such, the, such that the interface is growing, there is clearly a downhill acceleration, and that is something that breaks uh, the conditions of equilibrium in a very intuitive way. Uh, imagine I tilt this to angle zero, then this interface just, there's a balance of forces, and the interface will just grow to the sky. And in this case, however, when it's tilted, there's, there's a non-equilibrium drive in this problem in quite an intuitive way. Yeah. Ah, very, very, very good. Um, this is not the case. I mean, because uh, the, the equation has too many, it's, uh, theta is a real variable, so we can't allow uh, complex couplings because that will violate the reality of the phase, right? And it's, it, I mean, so that's a high-level argument. This can't be. The statement is just that, I mean, I, I basically decompose 
by doing this transformation, I, I managed to decompose this complex value declaration into real and imaginary part, and the, the imaginary part, so this phase part, it just stays imaginary all the time. It has to be like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, so maybe another way of, of saying it, yeah, so it's a nice circumstance where this quite maybe more complicated picture with many, many couplings that can be around, the whole non-equilibrium character is now compressed into a single real parameter. Yeah? A single parameter that measures whether the system is in or out of equilibrium. Yeah? So it's, it's just, I mean, this equation, yeah, a real scalar field variable just doesn't allow for complex couplings. Yeah, if you write it more technically, if you write it in the action, you can symmetrize it in a way that will drop out. So it just can't be, yeah? And, um, but still, I mean, lambda equals zero means equilibrium, lambda non equals zero means not non-equilibrium. So it's a single parameter measure for the non-equilibriumness of this problem. Yeah? It's just very handy. Yeah? So we don't have to think about any more about this spread. We just have to see, is this parameter zero or not? And then we know equilibrium or not. Sorry? In the original, yeah, in, in this equation up here. Yeah. So right, so, so they, the G, ha, so, so the two-body sector here, yeah, so this has a, a real and imaginary part. And the real part, this is the elastic collisions, imaginary two-body loss, as we said. Yeah? And the same now goes through for the single particle sector. Yeah? So there's a mu, a rotating frame, as we said yesterday, and some loss rate. And in principle, I could add here also some, here we only have coherent propagation, but ag again, as we said, under RG, everything that can happen, happens. So that is also a diffusion part, so a com a, a imaginary part, a coefficient uh, of, of gradient square. Mm -hmm. um, um, there is an intuitive argument in this. Um, I, this is actually a good question. Yeah? So <laughs> I always think about it can't be. And um, I mean, looking by the consequences, yeah, so it would, uh, would so, or, or maybe looking by this, um, yeah, so, but you also don't see it so nicely. No, I, I don't think I have now uh, right away. Maybe I think in the background <laughs> and I come back. Okay, other, other questions? Yeah, that's right. I mean, ah, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there is something going on like that. So the real thing is lambda plus yeah. So this is the the standard growth term. Yeah, but you can do a phase transforma a transformation. to absorb this. Yeah? So this is, I mean, you, this is saying, there is, it's like, I mean, this, this thing is a phase. Yeah? Think of a phase. And a phase, you can always move, go into a co-moving frame. Yeah? So you move with the phase itself, or in this uh, interface picture, you move with the interface. You put yourself on the interface, and you grow with it. In this frame, you don't see the linear growth, the trivial one. So that's why it's often left away because it's just a choice of rotating frame. But what you cannot remove, yeah, so they really, they come together, these guys, yeah, and um, this one you cannot remove by, by choosing a rotating frame or in a co-moving frame. More questions? What yeah, that's what we want to find out. <laughs> okay. Right, so, so the, the, the statement is, yeah, we, we look at dTn, dT theta, yeah? 
And then what the first thing we see when we look at this equation, yeah, so there is a term like a gamma loss minus gamma pump yeah, times n. Yeah. So this is really, and plus then some higher order terms, maybe n square, also gradients of theta. The point is, however, yeah, so whenever this is finite here, yeah, so the, the dominant effect on, from n is that it exponentially quickly finds its stationary state. Yeah? While all the terms here, they always have to come with uh, powers of gradient, yeah? so that's these terms, because the U1 phase rotation symmetry tells me that the equation must be invariant under the transformation of a constant phase shift. Right? So, and this can only, this invariance must leave, this must leave the equation of motion or the action invariant. This can only be realized if the phase variable appears together with gradients. Yeah? So, because then the gradient operation kills the constant alpha. Well, I, I mean, so, so when you know this, yeah, so you say this adiabatic elimination, yeah, so you say, this variable finds its stationary state very quickly. Yeah? So let, let me just forget about this time dependence. Yeah? And then I, I can solve for n of a function of theta. Yeah? And here is also some plus function of, of n. Yeah? And <laughs> then you insert it here, and that's how you eliminate it. Yeah? But this is the technical way to, do, to go. It's really not complicated. I mean, maybe it sounds more complicated than it is. The, the conceptual thing that happens, yeah? we have a fast variable. This we can integrate it out yeah? before even thinking about the slow variable. It's in the spirit of randomization group, yeah? everything that's fast, you integrate it out, and everything that's slow, you want to keep it. And then we have to study this in more detail. Yeah? And that's we are effectively deriving a low energy or low frequency theory for this phase variable alone, with a good reason, yeah? so that the density variable is decaying very quickly. More questions? Okay, good. Right. So this is this um, uh, KPZ equation as it was formulated originally. And again, yeah, we, we indeed we remove or we move our we put ourselves into the frame of the growing interface itself, and then the effect of the deposit is really just this nonlinear term. Yeah? And um, Right. Also, from this geometric picture, you can see, I mean, so you need to study a bit the geometry of this problem. You will see that in the, precisely in the case, and there is an assumption that the growth, that's important, an assumption that the growth goes um, perpendicular to the, to the tilted surface. Yeah? If you do this, then it's a geometric consideration that tells you if in the case that the interface is tilted, there's a nonlinear term. Maybe this is an intuition in the sense that, I mean, it goes away when you have no drive, when you have really a, an interface that just moves up, but no downhill acceleration. Yeah. So that's, that's um, maybe as intuitive as it gets from my view. Okay, where is this physics uh, realized? Um, this is, uh, for example, has been uh, roughly observed, yeah? it is not perfect, yeah? but in a defect growth in liquid crystals. So you always have to think in such problems, then in such surface growth problems, where is the drive? Yeah, and in this case, I mean, one, one puts an electric field yeah, that pulls this interface to go larger and larger. In a bacterial colony, yeah, you have an interface here at the edge of it, wh which is really driven by, I mean, bioorganisms. They, of course, driven open systems. They consume sugar, for example. Or also, uh, the spreading of fire fronts is another example. Uh, for example, burning of paper, yeah, which is driven by, by oxygen consumption. Yeah. Chemical reactions are also driven open uh, systems. Yeah. So now let's connect, the, let's go back to our um, precise problem. And the task that we now have, yeah, we, we coarse grained the problem down to a description of the slowest variable in the problem, the phase alone. Yeah. And then in the next step, we now have to get really quantitative. Yeah when we want to assess the question, what is the impact of this non-equilibrium non-linearity when we really go to large, asymptotically large macroscopic scales in the problem. Yeah? So until this point, we got away with, with basically simple arguments. Yeah? And now we have to do a calculation in order to assess what is the impact of this non-linear term 
at long wavelengths. In other words, we have to do, we have to track the flow, the renormalization group flow of this parameter lambda under renormalization group transformations by lowering and lowering uh, the resolution and going to larger and larger distances uh, in the problem. Yeah? So this is now the task. We track the um, behavior of this non-equilibrium strength lambda under renormalization group transformations. And here is the result for that. I mean, this, this is analysis has been done uh, ages ago yeah, in the context of KPZ. Um, and this is the flow diagram where this x-axis here is actually the dimension of the system. Yeah? So one dimension, two, three, and higher dimension, you can do that on a piece of paper. And here you track this, the size of lambda. Yeah? And the idea is then, yeah, so we, we initialize the system here, say, slightly out of equilibrium with a small but finite value. And then we ask the question, so does this become larger under randomization group transformations or does it become smaller? If it becomes larger, then the interpretation is that the importance of non-equilibrium effect becomes bigger and bigger. And we expect quantitative modifications of the long wavelength physics. Conversely, if it becomes smaller, this tells us that the system in the long wavelength limit effectively thermalizes. Yeah? So all the non-equilibrium ness of the problem then dies out. Yeah? So that's a neat feature that we package every non-equilibrium feature of this specific problem in a single parameter. So we just need to follow this single parameter to say, is this non-equilibrium or not yeah? at large distances. Yeah? And uh, there is a very general trend for systems with gapless modes, I, I claim, that namely, if you are in high spatial dimension, and you initialize, RG initialize, yeah, on this mesoscopic scales here, you initialize your problem with a weak perturbation out of equilibrium, then actually the RG flow directs you down. Yeah? So we will find asymptotically at very large distances, the system does not remember, although we broke equilibrium conditions on microscopic level, it will not remember this at very large distances. So this is one logical possibility that can happen, and that is what happened in systems with gapless modes. Conversely, if we go to low space dimensions, like one or two, you see really the opposite phenomenon. Yeah? So imagine I initialize on the mesoscopic scale my problem at very weak elongation from equilibrium, then it will grow and grow under RG and find this what is known as strong coupling KPZ fixed point. Yeah? It's a fixed point that, RG fixed point, it's not very easy to characterize. Even nowadays, it's still a, a challenge, but it's widely accepted that there is, uh, and also numerically confirmed, yeah? so that there is a, that there is a fixed point in, in this problem, which is a very far from equilibrium fixed point, yeah? where there is no detailed balance. Yeah? And um, the further thing that you can notice uh, is that under RG, uh, a length scale is actually generated where below which you would say the system is still pretty close to equilibrium and above this length scale, I mean at least there is a crossover regime and very much above this length scale one would say okay we are very close we are to this uh, strong uh, non-equilibrium fixed point. Yeah? So at, at short distances, yeah, so if we initialize it at, at weak, uh, weak elongation from equilibrium, we are very close to this equilibrium fixed point, but at large distance, uh, then, I mean, uh, beyond this crossover scale here, uh, the length scale, which is defined by this here, going order one, um, then um, we, we are close to this equilibrium fixed point. And if you solve for this length scale yeah, from the RG flow of this, uh, of this problem here, you find uh, this relation here. So it's actually for very weak initial uh, non-equilibrium perturbations, actually an exponentially large length scale in, in these two-dimensional systems. In one dimension, it's not uh, exponentially large. Okay, and then we can, with this um, understanding, we can now come to the final conclusion. Yeah? So what is the fate of the long, quasi-long-ranged or that low temperature or low noise level phase of this driven open uh, condensates like this exciton polaritons. The statement is this, yeah, from our understanding of the RG flow. At short distances, at short enough distances, at weak elongation from equilibrium, we will still see the quasi long range order scaling 
that we are expecting for an equilibrium system. But then, beyond this length scale that is unavoidably generated in two dimensions, we will sense the physics of this strong coupling fixed point. Yeah? And when we want to compute the scaling behavior of the correlation functions, we have to insert, actually, the understanding that comes from what's the critical exponent, say, and what's the scaling behavior at this KPZ fixed point. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And if you do this, then you find, actually, the correlation does no longer decay algebraically, but rather it decays here with a sub-exponential behavior. Yeah? So, and this a sub-exponential behavior is actually really governed by an exponent, yeah, so that is known from, from this strong coupling KBZ fixed point. Yeah, so it's a manifest non-equilibrium scaling behavior. But in one short word, yeah, it's interesting to notice that, I mean, it is impossible conceptually <laughs> to uh, put a system out of equilibrium and still expect quasi-long-range order. So this quasi-long-range order is really strictly forbidden by this reasoning here in um, due to the, to the non-equilibrium nature of the problem. Yeah? And so this is this summary here. And um, there's also now uh, beautiful experiments, yeah, still in one dimension, uh, that, that really confirm the, that measured essentially the, the uh, critical exponents of the KPZ universality class, which are even exactly known in one dimension. <coughs> so they, 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 they could confirm this, this mapping to K KPZ from experiments, and it's also impressive, yeah, so that, I mean, you still need huge systems, yeah, so to, to see the scaling behavior to, to resolve this in appropriate ways. Okay, so I think with this, I would leave it with a discussion of the low temperature phase. Of course, you, there's interesting stories about, I mean, what, what the fate of vortices yeah, in these two-dimensional systems, but I would now switch gears to the measurement part, unless you have uh, questions here. So please feel free. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, hmm? Right. I mean, so non-Markovian, I mean, so my take on this is, yeah, so that basically from a large enough distance, everything looks Markovian. Yeah? So let, let's imagine, yeah, so Markovian means that, I mean, your noise level is autocorrelated, just autocorrelated. Yeah? Now I take this function here, such a function, yeah, which is not a delta function, <laughs> but if I look at it from a very large distance, it almost looks like a delta function. Yeah? And, and I mean, mathematically, yeah, so it, it is, you can expand about this limit, yeah, and then up to higher order gradient corrections, you will not see much of this um, uh, non-Markovianity, except for the case, yeah, so, so when you do a calculation, you typically don't find a delta function, you find an exponential function. Yeah? So something like e to the minus uh, kappa t minus t prime, yeah? and some prefactor that makes that uh, you approach a delta function in the limit kappa to zero. Yeah? You, you have a highly non-Markovian situation, maybe if, if you, have, you replace this exponential scaling here really by, a, say, a power law. This is something that happens at zero temperature, for example. Um, there's also very special circumstances in which scaling of the noise level is realized in Lindbladian equations, and it's not a power law of time, but it's a power law in, 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 in space, yeah? and that comes maybe close to that, yeah? so a scaling function for the noise, that is something that could um, jeopardize this scenario, but whenever it's in the class of the natural, exponentially correlated uh, system, then, then it, it should collapse to this, back to this, to this problem, if you coarse grain for long enough. I mean, let's, I mean, in this, in this Keldish language, yeah, so this noise yeah, is the stuff that occurs sandwiched between these 
these fields, yeah? so these two quantum fields, that what stands here is the noise, yeah? and we have here dt, dx, yeah? so, and I mean, so Markovian, yeah? so just elaborating a bit more on this question, yeah, is that when we have here just a, a constant uh, decay level, yeah, so in, in the field theory spirit, again, what can happen is allowed, yeah? or, or what, what is allowed will happen, yeah? so maybe you have a gamma prime, which comes with a dx squared or a gradient square, and then a gamma prime prime with a gradient fourth. Yeah? So <laughs> yes, they exist, these terms, yeah? but they are, of course, these couplings here in the sense of the renormalization group, they are irrelevant. Yeah? And, and, but they will lead to a slight coloring of the noise in the sense that it's colored in the sense of spatially slightly correlated. Yeah? But I mean, it's, it's irrelevant corrections in the RG sense. So therefore, the statement is, I mean, these details at shorter distance, they don't matter for the long range wavelength physics. The only way out that I was pointing out is what happens if by chance this parameter is fine-tuned to zero. This is a different story. Then you run into these issues, yeah? so then you run into a scaling of the noise level, and that's a more subtle problem. Then. But this would require fine-tuning in a similar way that you have to fine-tune temperature to zero to see quantum critical scaling. Yeah, there's actually a really sharp analogy between scaling solutions of the action for a zero temperature quantum critical problem and a kind of scaling of the noise level um, in such a way that then you can have analogs of, of quantum critical scaling also in this driven open context. But it requires fine tuning. Uh, for disordered electronic systems, I would um, definitely recommend that <laughs> because I mean, you, with disordered systems, you have another problem. Yeah? So, you, you, I mean, you can look at it like that. I mean, disorder is like a bath, with the difference from the bath as we are looking at here. Yes, yeah? so you have, in, in other words, disorder problem is a is a kind of problem where you have random variables, yeah? but they are totally. Um, flat correlations in time, it's called quench disorder, yeah? while the noise we are considering here is delta correlated in time. Yeah? So it's like this order is a kind of bath limit where there's, which is quenched in time, while we have the opposite limit of Markov level in time. Yeah? What the disorder problem shares with, uh, with the, or, or the disorder problem I mean, you, you want to average over this bath, yeah? you want to integrate it out, and this can be easily done in the Keldish formalism. Yeah? And it's actually, there would be, could be some good reason to do this, because, um, I mean, this is now a detail which, which I just uh, tell you, so that, I mean, um, when you want to average over this order in an equilibrium partition function, you run into problem of having to average a logarithm of the partition function. And uh, you cannot do this easily. You have to resort to a replica trick that you, ha that you really can average moments of logarithm of z. Yeah? And uh, then you run into the replica formalism. In the Keldish formulation, you can avoid that. But I think that that's really a bit goes in a different direction. Yeah? But the uh, statement is, yes, you can describe disordered systems very efficiently with, with Keldish. It's not this ballpark here. There's a formal connection of you have some random variables. They are in a very different, operated in a very different regime, but the, the overall formalism would be very convenient for that. Yeah. That was a discretion. <laughs> Sorry. Any more? Yeah. Some people call it like that. <laughs> this is really a, sh a smooth phenomenon. Yeah? So there's nothing sharp. Yeah? There's no, I mean, I take a, I sense your question, but there's nothing, I mean, if I, if I take a derivative yeah, along this, I mean, so to say, length, yeah, so there's nothing non-smooth that's happening. It's, it's really a crossover phenomenon. Yeah? So this effect dominates at short distances because the RG flow has not grown enough, yeah? so we are still close to equilibrium, but at some scale the other effect starts to dominate because we're closer to the non-equilibrium fixed point. Yeah? Okay.
Good. So then uh, I switch gears. Um, something about 150 slides. To start <laughs> with lecture three. Um, right. So it's really a change of gears also for my mind. <laughs> I have to switch a bit now. And uh, this is the topic you get to know uh, yesterday already. And I want to look at it from a little bit a different angle, yeah, also slightly different models. Yeah, but um, I think it's interesting to, to somehow look at the same at least ball ballpark of problems from, from different perspectives. And here uh, we will see how far we can move with this, I mean, Keldish formalism. And uh, let's see how far we actually <laughs> move in this lecture. Yeah, so. OK, so here is my mini introduction, but I can, I guess, keep it brief. Yeah? My view on this measurement phase transition is this. Yeah? It's something, measurement is, 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 a, is a kind of physics question that usually comes from the small systems. Yeah? So we have this, again, this pattern. Now we want to go to large systems. Yeah? But so let's recall what measurements in small systems where, where, where they are declared somehow are about. You should remember from your quantum mechanics course yeah, so that almost on the axiomatic level, yeah, one postulates two qualitatively distinct types of quantum evolution. Yeah, one is the deterministic evolution under Schrödinger equation. Yeah, so in its integrated, integrated form, it would be applying this unitary operation here as a function of time. But then the other um, postulate of quantum mechanics is the measurement process. Yeah, and what then happens, the wave function of the system behaves not deterministically, but rather probabilistically in the sense that the wave function collapses, gets projected into one of the eigenstates of the measurement observable. So this P here is in the spectral decomposition, is a projector on, onto an eigenstate of the observable you're studying. Yeah? So, and um, the probabilistic element comes in here. Yeah? So this here is the born probability for this process to, to happen. Yeah, so for collapsing precisely into eigenstate number lambda. Yeah. And um, so, so, yeah, so, so this is kind of the probabilistic element of, of the measurement process. And clearly, yeah, this dynamics is quite interesting in the sense it will never end. Yeah. When the eigenstates, when, when the Hamiltonian operator that generates the deterministic evolution and the measurement operator, when they do not commute with one another. So if they commute, okay, then the dynamics would be like this. You collapse into an eigenstate of the measurement operator. Then because it commutes with the Hamiltonian, this is also an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. And so the system will stay forever. Yeah? So this is what also called quantum non-demolition measurements, when everything commutes with the Hamiltonian. More interesting is when, I mean, they don't commute, so they don't share a set of, um, of uh, the same set of eigenstates, the evolution will always go on. Yeah? And this situation, now we connect to many body physics, is something that is very well known, in, indeed, in many body physics. What is the physical consequence of two non-commuting operators in, say, the ground state of an equilibrium system? Yeah? This is exactly the situation that is discussed in, uh, in quantum phase transitions. Yeah? So there, just as a reminder, you look at a Hamiltonian, which consists of two terms which must not commute to have a quantum phase transition. And you also require that H1 and H2 stabilize um, ground states with, say, a very different symmetry, yeah? so, or with very different qualitative properties, at least. Yeah? Think of an example, uh, the, this uh, Bose-Hubbard model here. So this is, I mean, the H1 is realized by kinetic energy of, of uh, bosons hopping on a lattice and H2 is the potential energy coming from on-site interactions. Yeah? And then there is a competition between these two guys. The kinetic energy wants to delocalize the particles. And that gives rise to a superfluid phase. Sorry, that's this regime here, SF. And conversely, if the interaction energy dominates the particles, they want to be localized, have localized wave function, no phase coherence in the system. This is then this mod insulating states. And the question of this measurement-induced phase transitions, it can also be formulated as this. Yeah, let's put um, now to, uh, in a many-body system, 
uh, two sets of operators into competition, a Hamiltonian and measurement operators that both kind of want to push the system or want to have different structure in their eigenstates or something. And uh, then we ask, so is there any phase transition? And if so, how do they look like? So, and, and that's what you've seen yesterday, so I'll go here very quickly. Yeah, so this has been pioneered in these random circuits, yeah, so where, I mean, this really discussed it yesterday, and where, where just as a, as a re reminder, yeah, so, so the, the problem is very easily structured yeah, in the regimes where this competition, this dimensionless parameter that sits between the non-commuting operators in this sense here, in this problem, it is the number of measurements per unit time versus the number of unitaries that you throw onto the system per unit time. It's clear that in the random circuits when G is zero, so no measurements, then one has a non-integrable chaotic evolution that leading to entanglement growth, while conversely, if you have no entangling dynamics, the system, the measured system collapses into a product state, you see entanglement saturation, and, uh, okay, so let's, let's just remind ourselves that, I mean, there is actually what these works here have really nicely shown is that at a critical coupling strength, like in a quantum phase transition, yeah, so there is a critical point at finite um, competition ratio which interpolates in this uh, random circuits here between a volume law growth and a, an area law growth. And interestingly, yeah, so it's not uh, the trivial situation that I mean, it could also be, logically, it could just be that the, the critical point is at zero, uh, so and then a little bit of measurement, and then everything collapses into product states, but that's not the case. Yeah? So that's an interesting novel phase transition scenario that shows up in the entanglement entropy growth. Now, to this lecture here, um, I want to briefly um, introduce an alternative way of thinking about measurements instead of strong projective measurements, uh, weak continuous measurements that has the advantage that it lends itself to a path integral formulation of the problem. Yeah? With path integral, as you've seen, we always like an infinitesimal time step to be well declared and a projective measurement is really a hammer onto the system, so we need to weaken this a bit. Yeah? Then, I mean, I give you a little bit of phenomenology and then I hope I will still be able to at least give you a flavor of this um, uh, replica description or Keldish field theory description for, for this problem. Okay, so let's think first a bit about uh, the strong projective versus weak continuous measurements. So here is again um, what a projective measurement is about. Yeah? Say now of a continuous variable, we measure position, position x, yeah? and um, so this is the observable, and this is the, I mean, a continuum formulation of the, of the spectral decomposition of this uh, measurement operator where this P is the projector onto position X. Yeah? So if I do an, oops, oh sorry. If I do an actual measurement, then I will, uh, a strong projective measurement, I will end up in a definite position X naught. Somewhere I will detect my particle and then let me just write the projector onto this state X naught by the aid of a, of a delta function. Yeah, so it's a trivial uh, delta function you can do, telling us that the post uh, measurement position is X naught with certainty. Now we can realize, yeah, so that nothing in nature really is uh, perfectly sharp. Instead, um, processes take time and they are, might be a bit smeared out. Yeah? So um, instead of this in, in instantaneous collapse of the wave function, yeah, we might think of this, uh, we, we might think of softening this delta function into something that takes a finite amount of time here, delta t, yeah? uh, or this is the time of observation, and we replace a sharp delta function here by, by a sharp, this very sharp delta function by a, by a Gaussian, which still might be sharp. Yeah? But, but if, we, if we do so, yeah? or it's just uh, we can also represent it in this way, then we can uh, actually obtain both limiting cases, the limiting case of strong projective measurements obtains for this time of observation basically compared, and now you have to compare it to something, compared to other time scales in the problem is infinite. Yeah? So you give it infinite time to measure the system, then it really it approaches the limit of a projective measurement. But we can also analyze the, the, the opposite limit of weak continuous measurements. So imagine we look now 
we just watch the system for a small window time, but we repeat this measurement many times in a row. Yeah? And then the dynamics that, I, that previously was looking like that, yeah? so now resolving essentially each of these measurement processes in this limit looks li rather like that. Yeah? So it really looks like a path integral already yeah? in the sense that there is a step of unitary evolution yeah? interpierced by insertions of the measurement A, yeah? which happens now only for a small amount of time, but we repeat this very often so that we get eventually a continuum where in, in a continuum in time limit, yeah, the Hamiltonian updates of the state and the measurement updates of the state, they occur on equal footing. Okay, so um, then discuss a bit uh, the probabilistic character. Yeah. You can, uh, I mean, you can take other representations, yeah, other approximations to the delta function. It's a very good uh, question, which I, which I also want to address. Yeah? I mean, we do not expect, so the, quest, the question is, what questions do you want to ask later on? Yeah? So if it's about, does there exist a phase transition and what are its universal properties, I would claim yeah, so that the details of the measurement process, how you model this, do not matter. Yeah? Again, by RG type RG arguments. Yeah? While, I mean, of course, non-universal properties like where is the exact location of the critical point, these will see the details of the measurement process. It's really, again, it's this way of thinking, this has nothing to do with equilibrium versus non-equilibrium, it's just very general basic physics. Yeah? So details matter for non-universal properties, but for universal one, we don't expect it. Yeah? So there's a freedom in choosing the precise model. This model is, of course, more easy to handle in path integrals. Further? Okay. Good. So let, let me connect this also a little bit to this Langevin discussion that we had previously and the probabilistic character of these weak measurements. Yeah? So um, let's just declare, yeah? so the probability uh, to measure x on a state psi, yeah, which I unravel here, or which I write in a real space representation, and the limit delta t to zero, this Born probability is just apply this operator, yeah, so this uh, smoothened delta functions, uh, which I can also write as this, this trace here. Yeah, so this is just a rewriting, yeah, where the A is, is again the, the kind of smear delta function that we're using here. Yeah. And now the measurement outcome is a Gaussian random variable, why? because we can do the calculation, yeah? the expectation value of this, um, so first of all, you see it already here, it's a kind of Gaussian variable, something quadratic in the exponent, and um, more mathematically, you can see, you can look at what is the expectation value for measuring position x, yeah? so what's the average position that you will measure, then I just um, compute this um, x expectation value with respect to this Born probability distribution, and doing the manipulations, yeah, you see actually this is a very nice and interesting effect that the expectation value for the measurement of x naught precisely coincides with the quantum mechanical expectation value of the operator x. It's not totally trivial, this statement. Yeah? So the expectation value under, um, uh, under this um, probability distribution here of the measurement outcome x naught precisely is the expectation, the expectation value of the quantum operator x. Yeah? Furthermore, so we have for a Gaussian variable, we need expectation value, we need the variance, and the variance, I mean, if you do a similar calculation here, you find it to be determined by this. Yeah? And therefore, with this in mind, yeah, so this is a Gaussian distribution with characterized by expectation value and variance, and this is the point where we can transit from this probabilistic formulation to a stochastic formulation of the problem, as we did it, um, at least in our minds, yeah, when, when passing from the uh, Martin Sigler Rose path integral, probabilistic formulation, a deterministic formulation of a probabilistic problem into an explicitly stochastic equation, which was this Langevin equation. Same trick, we can apply it here. We just understand now that x naught is a random variable random Gaussian variable with mean 
quantum mechanical expectation value according to this calculation. And variance, which we can model by a random variable delta v, which has zero expectation, and this variance. The variance that scales with the square root of the time increment delta t. So this is, we pass from a probabilistic to a stochastic formulation of this problem. You can also look at then the stochastic update of the wave function. Yeah? And if we look at the infinitesimal um, time step update, yeah? so we do really a continuum limit in delta t, then if you pull through the calculation, you find that the update of the wave function is given by this, uh, by this object here. So here you see explicitly the, the noise increment. So this is really like a fluctuation in a Langevin equation, yeah, a stochastic force that acts on now a quantum wave function. You see here these expectation values around. They come just from this normalization that stands down, downstairs. So, this, 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 so reducing the operators by the expectation values, that's what happens in this equation. This is really nothing but taking into account the normalization of the wave function. And then you have just this stochastic update. Okay, now let's do the same step as we did yesterday. Go from a single particle or from a single degree of freedom that we observe now to many degrees of freedom. And then we now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? No, I mean, this is kind of a, classical randomness, if you like. So it's just, it's just a good bookkeeping. Yeah, we'll need this delta t later on, but I, I don't see any. So you can, you can take this arbitrary small while, a, while a, a, a commutator relation is bounded by h bar or so something. Yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, two? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> What's that again? <laughs> Spontaneous objective collapse. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. no, I, yeah, yeah, okay. Let me um, maybe um, try to, to um, elaborate a bit. So um, you, you don't get around this. this you, you can derive this. I mean, I now uh, declared it as kind of a limit yeah, of... Um, um, of, uh, of, a, of a softened uh, delta function, yeah? and this is a kind of heuristic way to go. Yeah? You could do this much more systematically, but you don't get around the postulate of measurements in quantum mechanics, yeah? so as far as I understand it. Yeah? So, um, and the point is this, yeah? so you, you, you can derive these weak continuous measurements in a physical setup in the following way. Yeah? You, you take a system you want to observe, you immerse this into an ancilla system that you allow to weakly entangle with the system you want to measure, and then you projectively measure the ancillary system. Yeah? And then, in this way, you get, only, you get full information about the ancilla system, but you only get little information about the, 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 measure, the system you want to measure, actually, and that is precisely what is uh, described here. Yeah? So you don't get a full collapse of the wave function, yeah, by just measuring the ancilla projectively, you get in a collapse of the ancilla, but it's only weakly entangled with the system, and so you get only little information about the system. And uh, so this is a totally systematic physical way of deriving this equation from some, from, let's say, at least from the first principle of the measurement postulate in quantum mechanics. Yeah? You can then go and ask, is this, can one derive this more fundamentally if you, but okay, let's see. <laughs> This is in part a philosophical discussion, in part maybe also some interesting physics, yeah. Sorry, sorry. In in, in which measurement, the, the continuous, projective versus projective? You mean uh, entanglement generation? Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, you want to know this connection? Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, okay. 
will come. <laughs> it's essentially, it's a limit where you don't read the measurements, yeah? so where you average over all the measurement outcomes. Maybe we'd, uh, you can ask again when, we, when, when, when it comes, and then you can ask if it's uh, enough or you want to have more details, okay? <laughs> Good. Yeah, because that's an important question. I mean, somehow, if I take it technically, what's the relation of this equation with the Lindblad equation, say? Yeah, so exactly, yeah, so that's actually something we can figure out. Okay, right, now we're going from, again, the step from few to many, yeah? So, and that is really, I mean, after what we've said all the time, it's not so, Difficult, so here I restored actually a Hamiltonian, yeah, so the infinitesimal generator of dynamics, of, of Hamiltonian dynamics, is the Hamiltonian operator himself, herself. And then we have these measurement contributions here where I put value onto this statement, yeah, so that in order to preserve the norm of the wave function, we have to subtract from the observable the, its expectation value. And then there is this noise update yeah, which really is like a Langevin equation now for concept for a quantum problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and let's let's look at this. Yeah, and let's also make the connection to the collapse of the wave function. Yeah, which you have you hammer your projective measurement uh, like a density, and then you know after that hammer the system will be in eigenstate of this local density operator. How? What's the analogy here? The statement is you, we can have a continuous collapse of the wave function. And to see this clearly, let's switch off the Hamiltonian again for a second yeah, and let just the measurement dynamics govern the system. Yeah. And then you, let's, let's think about this noise term down here. Yeah. So if this noise will always be a random force of the problem, but there is one fixed point of this equation for which the time evolution does not, where, where the wave function does not transform under time evolution anymore, and that is precisely the case yeah, if, the expect, if, the, if uh, psi is indeed in an eigenstate, in this sense here, of um, the local density operator. Yeah? So if this condition is fulfilled, yeah, so then although the noise is, is fluctuating, yeah, this part will die away, and then everything comes to rest, so the wave function will not evolve anymore under time, and that means, okay, we have a dynamical fixed point or a dark state, as it's also sometimes called, the dark state of the measurement operators is precisely the eigenstates of uh, the, the measurement operators. Yeah? So indeed, yeah, if the, if the system is locally in an eigenstate of particle number, then this equation here will be obeyed and the dynamics comes to an end. Yeah? And this is really, I mean, if you look at it in a dynamical way, yeah, you can see here a continuous collapse of the wave function. So this is the probability as a, for different times to measure uh, x naught, x some fixed x naught. Yeah? And you can see here if you start with a, a short time with this black curve here, and um, it's basically almost degenerate, but if you wait for long enough time, then you see how the system will find more and more the eigenstates of the measurement operator, so the probabilities to measure these, they become, I mean, order one, yeah, and, and everything else dies away. So this is a kind of, in the upshot, we have here really a continuous collapse of the wave function modeled in this weak continuous measurement. So that's maybe one part to this question, one, one part for the answer. We, we can say more questions for this. Okay, and, and then what I already said, yeah, so do we expect now, that was the question up here, do we expect now a, a, a difference in the universal behavior, uh, for example, or do we expect the, the, the phase transition that is present for strong projective measurements is not present uh, for weak continuous measurement? That was a discussion we already led, yeah, so the details of the measurement process, if you observe it very quickly, uh, or if you monitor it continuously, that should not affect the universal properties of the phase transition. In fact, was also uh, numerically verified in, in this. Okay, very well. So the next point, yeah, so that I would also <laughs> like to say a few words about, is actually how we can extract information now in, in the perspective, in this perspective on, on, on measurements. Yeah? And here, um, 
we have um, this, this, this statement here. So, I mean, I have a calculation, but I think I, I won't show it in details. I will put these little calculations, which I find technically instructive, I'll put them at the end of the file and you can upload this file. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because uh, because we we appreciate so much, yeah, so the the fact that we have a, a, a smooth smoothness in the dynamics. Yeah? So then you can formulate easily a path integral, yeah, be, because the measurement is something that is really a fundamentally different type of evolution, which is not smooth. Yeah? So I mean, if the projective measurement it takes you from say, some state and hits it into an eigenstate. Yeah? So this would not be something that is easily modeled in a path integral because there we want infinitesimal updates over time. Yeah? So we want to write it as e to the something small. And this is not possible for projective measurements. The, the, the theoretician would say, yeah, this is very different on a microscopic level, but I don't care about the, <laughs> on the macroscopic level. And actually, to be honest, I'm, maybe it's not totally true what I'm saying. <laughs> So, so whether whether there, there cannot be situations constructed yeah, where um, where the projective measurement give a, gives also a different universal physics from the weak continuous, it's, I don't have a super. I mean, except for this RG type argument, one thing that speaks in favor of such an argument is the following. Yeah, so we can smoothly interpolate between these two limits: yeah, weak strong projective and weak continuous limit. Yeah, so this is just taking this delta t parameter small or large. Yeah. And if you compare now two measurement scenarios, one strong and one weak, yeah? so these operators that I'm interpolating, they are mutually always commuting. So for sure we cannot expect a phase transition as the function of this interpolation. Yeah? Whether yeah, the, the, the universal properties of the phase transition might, but I, I wouldn't know another example in equilibrium where such things matter, but uh, I mean, devil might be in the details. Yeah? But that is my, my best argument yeah? on this interpolation. Yeah, we are interpolating between different sets of commuting operators, so no phase transition as a function of that. Question? Ah, okay, just <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> okay, that's also fair enough. Good. Okay, so this little calculation is, is, is in, in some script here, but let, let's just see what happens. Yeah? We can alternatively, and, and I want to now make the connection to the Lindblad equation. Yeah? We understood yesterday the Lindblad equation is an update of density matrices. Yeah? So now we have to go from this vector evolution, the stochastic vector evolution, we have to construct the stochastic uh, density matrix evolution. Yeah? So how do we do that? Well, we just uh, do the vector outer product here. And we look at the state update of this product here. Yeah? And you, maybe this I, I can easily give you. So what you have to do is, I mean, we want to now know d of psi, psi. Yeah? And this will be certainly d psi times psi plus d psi. And now, are we done? Why not? Exactly. Yeah. Very nice. We, uh, now I'm probably messing up all these vectors. The point is, yeah, so there is this dw thing, yeah, and we said this scales like dt square root. Yeah, so this was the variance. This was not the, just a guess. This was a really, that's how the variance looks like. So we have to expand this equation to second order in del dv to produce terms that are really dt, yeah? so by this argument. Hmm? So that is why one needs here actually to really t keep uh, the second order uh, differential change yeah? just to account for this uh, fun scaling with um, with uh, the time step, yeah? and then what you produce is this equation here. Yeah? So here is a linear element in dw. Yeah? It comes with this funny anti-commutator. But if you look at this first term here, you really directly recognize, oh, this is the structure of the Lindblad equation. Yeah? And so where this comes from, well, this d psi, yeah? so this is something like uh, 
um, minus i h d t yeah, plus, and then this reduced measurement operator, so some for density n with some strengths gamma halves or so. Yeah. So this is uh, plus d w um, n. So this thing and this all acting on psi. Yeah? So I insert this here. This gives me a right action. This will give me a left action. Yeah? So this is the other part in the Lindbergh equation. And this guy here, this will produce the coupling of the two uh, contours. Yeah? So the two, this will give me a left and right action in the structure of this Lindblad, almost Lindblad equation here. So upshot, yeah, what you can recognize here, it's basically the Lindblad equation, however, with some additional stochastic fluctuations on top of it. Yeah? But what we just declared is that the expectation value of dw is zero. Yeah? So <laughs> therefore, if you average this equation over realizations of the stochastic noise, you will precisely recover the Lindblad equation, and the physical interpretation of this is, yeah, so this delta w is our vehicle to, in a stochastic way, describe the probabilistic nature of the measurement process. So if you average over measurement outcomes, then you produce the Lindblad equation. This is the physical picture. And for projective measurement, you can make this even more direct, such a connection. You can uh, say, okay, or, or you can, there's this unraveling of the master equation, yeah, which, so where you write a density matrix evolution of a stochastic, as a stochastic evolution of pure state wave functions, and these trajectories that come out, they have more the interpretation of strong measurements. That's, okay, so that's a bit the connection of these approaches. Okay, good. Now we can understand a problem that, uh, that uh, surfaces here in the following way. Yeah? Now we have the evolution of this, um, of this state projector here. Yeah? So this is a projector, so row squares to one, uh, row squares to row for this pure state evolution. Yeah? But it's pure state in the presence of noise, yeah? of, of the stochastic element. And now let's look at usual observables. I can write them as a trace of the operator that I want to know the expectation of with this uh, state rho. Yeah? And then I have to do now, I, I, I compute, so to say, Conceptually, I, I would like to solve this equation for a given realization of, of the noise yeah, drawn from a Gaussian uh, ensemble. And then I would compute the expectation value of this operator by averaging over all the possible realizations of dw. Yeah? So this gives me then, then, I, then this tells me that I want to know actually the averaged row, averaged over all noise realizations. But there's now an immediate problem that you can see. This average here will always look like a unit matrix. Is this is clear, why? So who, who thinks this is obvious? I don't raise my hand. <laughs> so at least, I mean, but it's very easy to see. So um, this equation here, now there is a specific feature of the Lindblad operators being Hermitian themselves, yeah? which is the case for measurements. Yeah? For measurements, this is a special case of a, of a pre-Lindblad equation, if you like. Yeah? So the Lindbladian contribution to it yeah? has it that the Lindblad operators are Hermitian. That's not what we had yesterday or today even. Yeah? So we had always non-Hermitian operators like particle loss, particle pumping. Here we have Hermitian operators that corresponds to measurement is measurement of Hermitian observables yeah, of um, emission operators. So therefore, and now there is a special feature of Lindblad equations with Hermitian operators, and that's really very easy to see, yeah, so even sum over L. If I insert here something proportional to unit matrix, minus, just to do this super simple, um, observation squared, uh, you can see, of course, this just uh, cancels out exactly, and of course, also the unit matrix commutes with uh, any Hamilton operator. So that is 
how you immediately see that at least the uh, unit matrix here is a fixed point of the equation, a dynamically fixed point, and uh, you can uh, also, I mean, convince yourself, I mean, that, that it, or I think there's no totally precise statement, but very generically, this is also the only stable fixed point of the evolution uh, when the Hamiltonian and the Lindbladian are uh, sufficiently enough uh, non-commuting with respect to each other. Yeah? So then, I mean, we, we take it now that there's a, a unit matrix solution, and the unit matrix solution for the density matrix physically is always the limit e to the minus beta h, where beta goes to zero, so this is an infinite temperature state, yeah. infinite temperature unit matrix state. Okay, very good. So with this in mind here, we immediately see that any of the standard observables do not uh, work well for detecting any, anything in, in the phase transition like. Yeah, the solution is then that one can take um, non-linear uh, in the state observables, quote unquote, yeah, so we're leaving a little bit the standard uh, quantum mechanics where ob observables are linear in the state, expectation values linear in the state in, in this precise way here, but we could allow ourselves to look at state-dependent observables, and they have this property that a function of the average is no longer the same, the nonlinear ones, as the average of a function. Yeah? And examples of this yeah, are the von Neumann entropy. That's what you also looked at in the, in the other lecture. So that's why this is a good measure of this phase transition. It just is a highly nonlinear function of the state, and we just don't have at least this killer argument that there will be nothing observable in such a, in such a quantity. Yeah? But you can also be a little more um, um, modest yeah, and say, okay, I, I want something that is not arbitrary power in the state. Maybe it's enough to look at something that is quadratic in the state projector. Yeah? So this is an average. Uh, each of these averages here involves one power of rho. So this is nonlinear in the state in that sense. Okay. Sorry, I, I, mm -hmm. The last statement in the uh, why mm -hmm. you are not looking at Carnot state correlator? Instead, you are looking. Yeah, at we also do. <laughs> you can subtract something. Yeah, but I mean the point is yeah. So the, the point is that this thing here has a chance of hosting still non-trivial information, okay. because it is not linear in the state and it's not so to say. Its, its efficiency in detecting something non-trivial is not immediately killed by the statement in line one. Yeah, so, <laughs> simple as that. Yeah? Right. Mm. Good. Yeah, so, so here, I mean, as an example, let's just look at, I mean, just to also illustrate a bit more how this dynamics is running here. So, um, we can look here at our model yeah, for, of, of, of particles hopping yeah, and measured uh, the density being monitored and the Hamiltonian being just a hopping. Yeah? So let's operate this, this setup here on just two sides. Yeah? So particle can hop left and right and then it's monitored on either of these sides. So let's just look um, at uh, how these statements that I made play out really in practice yeah? and what we, this can tell us about this measurement induced phase transition. So let's look at the strong monitoring limit before. So if you if you have no Hamiltonian at all there, so then this dynamics will just be this continuous collapse into one of the eigenstates of the measurement operator. Yeah? Next level is let's switch on a little bit of Hamiltonian dynamics, a little bit of hopping of left and right, and then you see this thing here. The um, particle is basically at all times yeah, pinned, still pinned to the eigenstates of the measurement operators unless for very short excursion times where it transits. Yeah? So in a little bit like instantons and quantum mechanics, yeah, so this is almost all the time in one of the eigenstates of the measurement operator, but sometimes it transits. Yeah. So, and then the opposite limit of weak monitoring, now the hopping dominates, and then these plots here, they have the interpretation basically of Rabi oscillations of a problem that you don't measure at all. Yeah. So then you would see it always going back and forth between these two different minima in, in energy here. And, um, this is the opposite limit in the sense that really here the system is always, is almost all time pinned to the eigenstates of the measurement, while here is essentially only here and there, only in a zero set of time, it is really close to the eigenstates of the measurement operators. 
And despite these massive visible differences that you can see easily on a computer but not in an experiment, yeah, it is invisible in the linear averages. These two situations here, they will not show in the linear averages, yeah, so in, in these guys. But for example, indeed, if you look at such a connected correlator, yeah, just to subtract some stuff you're not interested in, at least you see that this nonlinear in the state observable here, this will see some signal, some smooth signal. Yeah? And the idea is then, if we go to a thermodynamic limit, maybe this smooth signal becomes a sharp signal. Yeah? So it becomes a non, it de develops a non-analyticity as a function of system size. That is how you see phase transitions also in equilibrium problems. So that is the, the physical picture. Yeah? We are looking now, we'll be looking at such observables here, and um, which are nonlinear in the state, and we'll look whether such a signal here that sees something about the qualitative physics of the problem, whether this can become sharp in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, and this is now the model we studied. I just leave it, I think, at this. We really look at this hopping here, and the, the measurement is the local particle density. This leads to entanglement growth. This leads to entanglement saturation. And let's go quickly here, so that's also just a repetition. So this is the Hamiltonian. If you leave this alone govern the dynamics, it will lead to a volume law growth of entanglement, as you've heard it yesterday. If we just have the measurement operators on no Hamiltonian, we get, of course, a product state, so area law entanglement. But we have to keep now in mind to evaluate the physics of this problem. We have to keep in mind that this psi is a Gaussian, is a random variable. And um, so we have to find the proper statistical analysis tools, yeah, these nonlinear in state correlators to extract information. Now, how does this look for in this problem? Here is the, the phase diagram for this problem of, of fermions hopping on a lattice. So here we put this parameter is the measurement strength versus the hopping strength. And the most important axis is the one in the thermodynamic limit, yeah? so one over L. So here, this axis here is thermodynamic limit. And what we find there is that this volume law that I tell that happens at um, no measurements at all is actually an unstable point and it's immediately replaced by a logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy. And this is an extended phase for this problem with a logarithmic growth of the entanglement. And then at some point, it, we get a sharp um, cut off and we transit into an area law. So it is also a measurement induced phase transition in the visible in the entanglement scaling. However, it's not a volume to area law, it's a kind of log law to area uh, law transition. Yeah? Okay, so here are some details. And I think this is an important uh, or interesting figure. So that gives a hint what kind of phase transition this might be. Namely, we look here at the um, coefficient of the logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy in, in this phase here. And what you see, this coefficient here, at some point drops really by a few orders of magnitude. And this is something that might remind some people of, of Kostalitz-Taulis phase transition, where instead of the coefficient of such a logarithmic um, term in the entanglement entropy, such a behavior is observed for the superfluid stiffness. So there is a what is called universal jump of the superfluid stiffness, which is exactly happening at the Kostalitz phase, Taulis phase transition, that's at least a qualitative hint that this problem could be somehow related. And in fact, if one applies BKT scaling to observables in this problem, one sees, oh, this is indeed looks like a BKT scaling. And maybe in the last five minutes, I will give you a flavor on how to, um, how to see this coming out, why, why this should be coming out of this problem. And in which, in particular, also in which degrees of freedom for this problem. So to approach this problem, we want to work starting from the weakly measured side, yeah, so around here, so only very weak, so weak in the sense of gamma over j yeah, is a very small parameter in this problem. Now then you can look at how does the dynamics of, say, this particle number expectation value look when, when you look at it at a, on, on a computer. Yeah? And then you see here actually there's this structure really of left and right moving ballistically propagating fermions in the game. Yeah. And um, to model this, we can go and patch our Brion zone. Yeah, for the, we have a dominant Hamiltonian now, which is just hopping. And then we have uh, occasionally these measurements, a weak, weak um, amount of measurements in the problem. 
So we can go and patch this Brion zone here into many little patches, yeah, each of which has a linear dispersion. And you can see from this picture here that there's actually a dominant velocity, which actually in fact comes from, this, uh, from the fermions that are here in the center of the Brion zone. So this will be our dominant patch. Yeah, so, and essentially in the spirit of a low energy theory, there would be more words to spend. Yeah, one, one can reduce this problem now to looking at these patches here uh, one by one. And the most dominant one is the, the red one in the middle of the, in the center of the Brion zone. But this situation is something that you might know from your condensed matter course. Yeah, you can linearize the fermionic dispersion relation and then the lattice model of fermions goes into a description of a continuum Dirac model description. Yeah? So in the Dirac model yeah, is something pretty simple. Yeah? It is you have two flavors of fermions, which in this case are realized by left and right moving particles. Yeah? And there is a matrix sigma z sandwiched between these uh, spinners, which uh, where, where the minus sign in the sigma z matrix is just the opposite uh, direction of, um, of motion of these particles, left and right, and there's just a linear dispersion, yeah, which basically you read off from, I mean, from these patches here. Yeah? So this is, we linearize around this for every of these patches. Okay, so this is the kind of how one can take a continuum limit for this problem, and we end up with this Dirac fermions, and then probably also know this, yeah, when, once, when one can justify such a description, then you can pass from the fermionic representation of the problem into a bosonic uh, representation by the bosonization dictionary, where this free Dirac problem here transforms into a free Luttinger liquid description. Yeah? And these Luttinger variables that occur, they are the phase fluctuations and the density fluctuations. So, this is the bosonized version of, the, um, of this Dirac problem. Okay, and then we have to pull through, of course, also our local measurement operators through this uh, bosonization dictionary. And then you see actually two terms, yeah? a local density of fermions. Yeah? Every fermion is, comes with a left and right mover. So there's actually two um, combinations that show up. One is called a, um, a current operator in this Dirac theory. If you bosonize this by using the bosonization table, you get a linear gapless, uh, so an operator, a dx operator acting on the density variable. So this is density fluctuations. And then there is also this uh, con contraction here, which gives us a nonlinear term, nonlinear in these uh, density fluctuations. And uh, then one has to think about so what's actually the importance of this, uh, this nonlinear term. Yeah? You can clearly see that there is a competition in this uh, bosonic description. Yeah? These operators of variable phi, they don't commute with these phase fluctuations here. So that will give us a competition and potentially give rise to a phase transition. And the intuition is really so that this bosonic theory describes the long wavelength uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations of the conserved fermions that are, that are propagating in this problem. And what you can also learn from that, yeah, we, the problem setting is now a basically a Gaussian theory. Yeah, so everything with these guys is quadratic, but unfortunately there is this, or maybe interestingly, there is this nonlinear, cosine nonlinear term. Okay, right. And um, so here is the way, so now comes this um, replica construction. Yeah, so we have to do that because we want to represent correlators which are nonlinear in the state. So we can rewrite this, this, this correlation function here, in particular as a product of traces of rho and then average over, uh, over the noise. So we can describe these correlators by introducing replicas in, for, for the density matrices like this. It's completely analogous to in Fox space yeah, or tr in introducing operators in Fox space yeah, via tensor products of, say, single side Hilbert spaces. Yeah, so it's the very same idea. And um, also the operators that act on these replicas, they, they, they get uh, represented in this tensor product space. And then you can rewrite nicely this correlator here in this replicated uh, formulation. And the beautiful feature about this is that this um, correlator here that is nonlinear in the original density matrix becomes now linear 
in the replicated density matrix. So what we eventually want to have is an equation of motion for the averaged but replicated density operator. And this can be done, yeah, and um, then you, you can end up, you end up with the evolution equation for this replicated density matrix in the very same spirit as we, we had it for the single measured wave function. Yeah? And the dynamics looks like that. Yeah? So it is two decoupled, um, this piece here is two decoupled Lindblad operators that are not talking to each other. They are just both, each of them would heat up the problem to infinity. But then there is also a coupling that comes between these different replicas. And that is a very important term that will determine the physics of this problem. And of course, there is still also this stochastic forcing term. But if we take the average of this equation here, then this term will go away. Yeah? So these this are the interesting terms, two individual uh, Lindblad operators that we know already, but now there is a new piece that, that has no counterpart in single, uh, single replica evolution, this replica coupling. Mm -hmm. And um, for Gaussian theories, yeah, uh, an interesting insight is that these, um, that we can, like the Keldish coordinates, we can introduce new coordinates for this problem, new fields, new operators, which are the average coordinate, the center of mass, and the relative coordinate. And when we do so, we can decouple the complicated equation of motion for, um, for the replicated system into a single equation of motion, uh, decoupled, a single equation of motion for the average coordinate and another independent equation for, um, for the relative coordinate. Yeah? And the upshot of this is that the, um, the absolute coordinate only describes heating yeah? and the relative coordinates only describes damping. Yeah? So this was exactly possible due to this coupling of the different replicas to each other. And um, the physics of this phase transition, and I think I'm, I'm coming to an end, yeah? so the physics of this phase transition is really encoded in these relative replica fluctuations. They look like, if you include the nonlinearities, they look like a um, non-Hermitian variant of a sine gordon model. And this sine gordon model of the relative replica fluctuations, yeah, that is undergoes then a BKT phase transition and that kind of makes peace then with, with the numerical observation that we had previously. So sorry, that was a, in the end very fast. Um, anyways, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy if you want 